Let's look down at Hosea chapter number 5 and look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Hear ye this, O priests, and hearken ye house of Israel. So now again, we're continuing with this judgment. The first few chapters um, you know, laid out this analogy of you know, Hosea marrying um, Gomer and this analogy of adultery of an adulterous nation that turned against God and betrayed God as you know, Gomer's, um, you know, was out to, he was told to marry a prostitute, and he went out and he did that, and of course, she turned on him just as um, the nation turned on God, so God made um, his point in a very profound way that we're going to see some of that um, repeated here in the next couple verses, but look down um, at verse number one, it says, and give ear, ye, O house of the king, for judgment is toward you, because you have been a snare on Mitzpah, and a net spread upon Tabor, those are two cities in the northern kingdom of Israel, and the revolters are profound to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. So this is just interesting. This is a repeating theme. If you want to just jump over to Genesis chapter number 6 um, real quickly, uh, and we'll take a look at this just for a minute. I've mentioned this before, but this is a repeating theme in the Bible, that rebellious nations, nations that turn um, against God, and this is something that I think it's important that we understand um, as Americans, as a nation that is turning against God um, as we live in it today. But it says the revolters are profound. You're going to Genesis chapter 6 to make slaughter, though I have been a rebuker of them all. So here we see that this nation of Israel, they've turned against God. They're, you know, they're an adulterous nation. But the Bible here, and it says this about, you, you see this as the end state of all nations that turn against God, is it just turns to violence and it turns to violence. As a matter of fact, the reason for God destroying the earth was not just because, look down at verse number 5 of Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 5, where the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So here, you know, this is kind of the, the reason that people give um, for God, you know, flooding the earth and saving Noah and his family, but really, you know, God doesn't, you know, he's not going to come and just destroy the whole earth because people were thinking bad things, right? And if you skip down a few, ver few verses down to verse number 11, you kind of see um, what, did the, what was the result of the evil thoughts? What was the result of, you know, these, these people that were thinking all these evil things and all these wicked things? If you look at verse number 11, it says, the earth was also corrupt before God and the earth was filled again with what? with violence. So that's the same thing. So all that to say this, the rejection of God equals violence. And a lot of people, you know, that's why, you know, we need the Bible to make, you know, as Romans says, to make sin exceedingly sinful to us, because the way sin is sold to us, and the way sin is sold to you is the way sin has been sold, you know, since the beginning of time, is that it's harmless. It's no big deal. Did God really say that? It's not a big deal. There's not really going to be any consequences to it. A lot of times today, you know, when it comes to Hollywood and, you know, things in America, sin is literally made to look fun. I mean, and it may even be fun up at the beginning in the short term. There may be that reward of sin for a season. But the point is this. All of this sinfulness, all of these wicked thoughts, it doesn't matter what nation is, what time of, you know, history it is, it all leads to violence. And that's what it always comes down to. I mean, we can see it in America today. We can see it with, you know, the abortion holocaust that we've been dealing with in this country for decades. If that's not, I literally preached a sermon on abortion called violence. Because there is literally no definite, I mean, violence is literally like doing harm to an innocent person. That's what it means. Right. So, you know, two men that are, you know, striving like maybe one and, you know, maybe one is, is in self-defense. He's not a violent person if he's defending himself. The person that's violent is someone that is attacking someone who is innocent. But the point is that a nation that rejects God and turns against God, it may seem harmless and silly and fun and, you know, hedonistic or whatever they call it. Uh, today to just go out and do whatever you want, but it always leads to violence. So in, even in America today, the more we turn against God, the more violent that this country will get, period. And it always starts with the most innocent. That's why you see with abortion. It always starts with violence against the most innocent people in 
the, in the nation that is turning against God, which is what? The children and the women, always, every single time. All right. So look, go down to verse number three. That's not really the, what I want to get at tonight, but just to show you that, you know, these patterns, these trends are recognizable. All right. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom and Israel is defiled. So Ephraim is that large tribe that is right next to Judah that is in the northern kingdom of Israel. They will not fame their doings to turn unto their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. And the pride of Israel doth testify to his face, therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah also shall fall with them. So now we see a little bit of a, a turn here, where it's talking about Israel and Ephraim and the judgment and the pride of them. This is why they won't listen to the prophet, by the way, because they're prideful. So people that, you know, don't listen to the word of God are prideful people where, you know, the word of God just bounces off of them. And they're like, you know, I don't like that. I don't want to hear that. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the point is now he brings in Judah into the equation here and Judah shall fall with them. Why is that? Well, he explains it in just a couple verses. They shall go with their flocks, with their herds to seek the Lord. Verse six, they shall not find him. He have withdrawn himself from them. So again, pointing out that at some point it's just too late and judgment is coming. All right. So nations are going to pay for what they've done, for the violence that they've committed, all of these things, the, the, the injustice that they've done, they're going to pay. We can apply that to ourselves as well. If we got everything right tomorrow, if we just fixed everything tomorrow and every, uh, all the false churches went away and all the wickedness went away and, you know, just people were getting saved left and right and people were just like turning to the Bible, turning to God, we're still going to pay for what's happened. That's how God works. God is just, okay? Look at verse number 7. They've dealt treacherously, treacherously against the Lord, for they have begotten strange children. Now this... At this uh, maps to Hosea chapter 4 we talked about last week, how the next generation of these people, they're, they're not even going to be saved. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about how they've turned from the Lord and their children are not even going to be saved, period. Now shall a month devour them with their portions, just showing how quickly the judgment is going to come. Blow ye the cornet in Gibeah and the trumpet in Ramah. Cry aloud at Beth Haven after thee, O Benjamin. Again, now... Not just talking about cities in the northern kingdom of Israel, but talking about places that are in Judah. Benjamin was a tribe that was part of Judah, all right? Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel have I made known that which, surely, that which shall surely be. Now look at verse number 10, and we're going to stop here. And I want to talk to you about Judah and verse number 10 tonight. The Bible says this. It says, the princes of Judah... We're like them. So, again, he starts bringing up Judah in the verses, the, uh, the few verses before this. And, but he's mainly talking about, Hosea is talking about the judgment, the destruction that's going to come to the northern kingdom of Israel. And we know that Judah didn't go into captivity for 180 years or so after the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away and destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. We know that Judah didn't, didn't suffer that same fate. However, I did read for you the story in 2 Kings chapter 18 on purpose last week where you saw that there was some judgment that came upon Judah when the Assyrian Empire came and took over the northern kingdom of Israel. Many of the border cities of Judah fell at least for a while while, you know, the Assyrian army came to Jerusalem. Then, of course, Hezekiah, you know, did the right thing. He relied on the Lord and the Lord then freed Judah from the Assyrian army. But why did that happen? Why did they have a little bit of judgment that came to them as well? The Bible's explaining it in verse number 10. And it says, the princes of Judah, meaning the rulers, the people in charge, were like them that removed the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means simply that they did not keep the boundaries that God wanted them to keep. He wanted them to be separate from the northern kingdom of Israel. They were not. They intermingled, and they took part in some of this evil that Israel was doing, and they paid a price for it. They didn't pay as much of a price as Israel paid for it, but they did 
pay a price. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 19. So tonight I want to talk about the importance, the importance of boundaries. The importance of boundaries. And there's two points I want to make about boundaries. But the first point with boundaries is that we must have boundaries. And the Bible here is talking literally, when you look at these nations, Israel and Judah, you know, we're talking about a, a literal boundary, a border of a nation. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse number 14. The Bible talks a lot about landmarks and boundaries between different places and different pieces of land. I mean, literally it talks about boundaries. And that's what I want to look at first. Look at Deuteronomy 19 and verse number 14. The Bible says this in verse 14 of Deuteronomy 19. It says, Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which they of, and this is important because this applies to the spiritual every single time, but it says this about the landmark. It says, They of old time have set in thine inheritance which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God give thee to possess it. So it's important to know that the boundary, the landmark, the, the stone, the boundary, the survey marker, whatever you want to call it, was put there by people that came before. So when you inherited the land, what did you inherit? You inherited a piece of land. You just didn't inherit this piece of land where it was like, well, it's kind of like over by that tree over there. No, you inherited this piece of land that said it's between this landmark and this landmark, this boundary and this boundary. It's literally like it was already mapped out by people that came before you. That is super important to understand as we move forward talking about boundaries tonight. So literally Deuteronomy 19 is talking about physical, actual boundaries in land. All right, turn to Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter number 22. It's saying, hey, don't, don't move your neighbor's landmark. It's talking about this landmark that people of old time, the people of previous generations put there, you know, and don't move it to, like, get yourself, like, some, some more land or something. You know, I mean, there, there used to be, I remember between pastures, m most of the time when you had somebody that had, like, a quarter of land that was next to a, a different um, owner's quarter of land. I'm talking about 160 acres of land, if you don't know what that means. But, you know, 160 acres of land and then 160 acres of land, normally there'd be one fence in between um, those two pieces of land, and that fence would, you know, uh, just be right on the dividing line of the border. But a lot of times, you know, if you had these two, you know, different owners that couldn't agree, maybe they didn't agree exactly where the fence would go, or they, you know, wanted to build different kinds of fence, or one didn't want to help with the other fence. A lot of times it was just the goofiest thing, but every now and then you'd see two fences. You'd see two fences, and then you'd have like this, you know, five foot no man's land in between these two fences, between these two pieces of land. But it was just, you know, just kind of this debate. It wasn't maybe necessarily a debate about where the fence was to go, but just some kind of disagreement. But the point is, people, there's people out there that'll just try to just like get an inch or two or whatever it is from you. They'll build a fence and they'll just build a little bit further uh, on their side of the pasture so they get some of your land. And the Bible here is saying, like, hey, don't cheat people. Don't cheat people of the landmarks that were put there before, you know, you know, you were even here, before you even inherited the land. Look at Proverbs 22, verse number 28. The Bible says again, it says, remove not the ancient landmark, which who? Again, we see another, uh, you know, reference to the previous generation. Remove not the ancient landmark, which thy fathers have set. Flip over to Proverbs 23, just one chapter over, and look at verse number 10. Proverbs chapter 23, and look at verse number 10. You say, why would the Bible, why would Proverbs just keep talking about, like, borders of land? And, you know, the borders of these things. Look at verse number 10 of Proverbs 23. The Bible says, remove not the old landmark, and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. For their Redeemer is mighty, and he shall plead their cause with thee. So this is saying like, hey, you know, I mean, look, it, it's, a, it's an application to not rip people off is, is what it's talking about. It's saying keep those boundaries where they're supposed to be, and it's making a reference here to somebody who maybe, maybe there's a widow or something that doesn't really know where the boundary is, and then, you know, the you know, her, maybe her husband knew, and then he died, and then the neighbor's like, oh, yeah. He's like, I can move the fence now. I'm going to have to rebuild this fence. And he goes, and he just takes, like, a bunch of extra land, and nobody's the wiser. The Bible's saying, hey, don't take advantage of people in that way. But it's using this reference 
of this landmark, of this boundary in the fields that was put there by previous generations. You say, why would it keep using, I get it, don't rip people off, don't take advantage of people. Look, you could take advantage of people out there. People do it all the time. That's why people are targeted. It, it points out the fatherless here. It's pointing out, you know, somebody that doesn't have protection. Somebody that maybe doesn't have that wise counselor to help them, you know, protect their things. Don't take advantage of people that are easy to take advantage of. This is why scammers target, you know, the fatherless or the elderly and people that just aren't the wiser to all these things. The Bible's saying don't do that. But the reason that it is using this analogy in this reference to landmarks is because there is a literal spiritual application as well. Turn to Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter 16 and look at verse number 6. Psalm chapter 16 and verse number 6. It's a perfect analogy that the Bible uses here when it's even just teaching, hey, don't rip people off, don't take advantage of people. You know, just just because you can take advantage of someone doesn't mean you should because God is watching. That's what Proverbs 23, verse number 10 is saying. He's saying the fatherless are fatherless. They look helpless, but their Redeemer is mighty. God is watching over the fatherless, and he shall plead their cause with thee. And in many references, this even applies to the nation of Israel. This even applies to the abortion holocaust, this even applies to this nation where we've taken advantage of the most helpless among us, and here we see that, guess what? Their Redeemer is mighty. These children that could not defend themselves, they have a mighty Redeemer. They have someone who will, you know, take vengeance for what has happened and make that situation just okay look at psalm chapter 16 let's look at the spiritual application of this analogy psalm chapter 16 look at verse number six this is a great verse in the bible but i want to read three verses here i want to read verse six through eight where the bible says this it says the lines what are we talking about here we're talking about the boundaries we're talking about the borders the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places yea i have a goodly heritage I will bless. Now, now he's not talking about land here. He's talking about his spiritual heritage that he's inherited. And what is he calling them? He's calling them boundaries. He's calling them lines. He says, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Ye have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. So he's saying, look, I've, first of all, here's the two points I want to make on boundaries. This guy, the psalmist, David is saying, I got good lines. He said, I was given boundaries. I was given those lines. And they fell to me, and they were good. They were in good places. But look at verse number 8, and that's the second point that I want you to think about tonight. When you think about boundaries, boundaries that you've been given, you know, the heritage that you've been given, it says, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is my right hand. I shall not be moved. So he's saying, I've been given lines, I've been given boundaries, and he's saying, I am going to keep those lines, and I am going to keep those boundaries, and if he does, guess what his son will be able to say? His son will be able to say, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, if he cannot be moved. So we need to think about boundaries tonight, we need to think about... Do we have boundaries, number one, and we should not move those boundaries? So if we've been, especially if you've been given boundaries, you need to keep those boundaries. You need to keep those lines in those same places. You, not, you need to not be moving those landmarks. So your next generations can say, the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. So look, holding boundaries is important. You say, well, I had to build all my boundaries myself. I'm a first-generation Christian, and I had to build all the boundaries myself. It is still equally important that you hold those boundaries. It's great that you're building them yourself and you've built them yourself, but if you want to pass those boundaries on, you must not be moved. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 4. Turn to 1 Peter 
chapter number four. Let's talk about having boundaries. Let's talk about having boundaries today. A major problem when I think, and I'm going to spend most of the sermon on this, but when I think about boundaries today and boundaries that have been moved today, I think about churches. I think about churches and the boundaries that have been moved with churches. Now, here's what's interesting. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 4. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says this. It says, yet if any man suffer as a Christian. So he is talking about Christians here. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about false prophets and false churches. But he's talking about Christians here. He says, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Now look at this in verse 17. It says, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? The point is, what is he saying about the church here? He's saying that, now go to Acts chapter 5, because we studied through the book of Acts, but a lot of people will hear this story in the book of Acts, and they'll be like, that's crazy. It seems extreme. The story of Ananias and Sapphira. Go to Acts chapter number 5. Let's look at this real quickly. Acts chapter number 5, and look at verse number 1. Acts chapter 5, look at verse number 1. I just want to read this story for you. And I want to give you just practical application that judgment begins at the house of God. And it, if it first begins at us, it's saying it first starts with you. God is looking at you and he's going to be extra critical at what happens in the house of God. It's not that judgment's not coming to, you know, those that don't obey the gospel. It's not that judgment's not coming outside the church, but he's saying in the church, he's like, it's there first. Let me just give you a couple examples of this tonight. In verse number one, it says, but a certain man, they're talking about how all these people are starting the church in Jerusalem, and they're all just coming, and they're just giving all their possessions, and they're just pooling everything else, and they're all super excited, they're all super fired up, and a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. So everybody was selling everything and, you know, just giving everything to the church. But this guy, you know, he probably had a lot of money and he sold some of his stuff and he brought it and he kept back part of the price. Now, that wasn't the problem, okay? But Peter said, Ananias, and he brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, and then Peter explains here. He says, whilst it remained. I mean, it's not that Peter just wanted everything. It's that this man was glorying that he had done everything that everybody else. Just imagine a guy that was worth, you know, 500 bucks, and he just comes and gives all 500 bucks to, this is what happened. Gives all 500 bucks to this church at Jerusalem so we can get this thing going. And then here's a guy that's maybe, you know, worth 200,000, and he comes and he gives 10,000. And he's like, here's 10,000, and that's everything that I have. The problem is, is that he represented that, that was everything that he had. He lied, is what it came down to. He says, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? He's like, you could, do, you could sell or keep whatever you want, Peter is saying. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart, and thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. He literally died. God killed him for this. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Why? Because judgment begins at the house of God. That's why. God's like, we're starting this. This is the first church after Jesus goes to heaven. We're going to be serious about this thing. Look at verse number six. And the young men arose and came up and carried him out and buried him. And about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what had done, you're like, that's harsh. Well, it gets worse. Let's keep reading. Came in and Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. So she told the same lie as Ananias. She's like, yep, we gave you all the money. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. And she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young man carried them in, found her dead, carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So God just took these folks to heaven right there. Just because they were, they were lying to the Holy Ghost, and they were messing around in the house of God. And like judgment must begin at the house of God. Now apply that to what you're seeing with churches today. <laughs> apply that to what you're seeing. I mean, we're not even talking about false prophets here. 
We're talking about saved people that God just took home. We're talking about, I mean, we're not talking in 1 Peter chapter 4, judgment, you know, must begin. It says, I mean, it literally says, judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, he's talking about saved people. He's talking about people that are going to heaven. It's not even talking about false prophets. Look, false prophets and, you know, false prophets running false churches, those aren't churches. Those are not churches. Most churches you see today are, are, are not churches, according to God. Look, but here's, here's all i got to say. Even, even churches that have the right gospel today, there's going to be a lot of pastors that have a lot to answer for. That's, that's what the Bible is telling us here. Let me just give you a few examples. I mean, just think about this. Think about a church that has the right gospel. The pastor is saved. Maybe some people in the church are saved. Maybe a majority of the people in the church are saved. And they have the wrong version of the Bible. Think about that line. Think about that boundary. That has been, I mean, that's removing a boundary. That's not moving a boundary. A church that doesn't even have the word of God. Let me ask you this. Where would be the doctrine in that church? In a church that doesn't even have the word of God. I mean, haven't you met so many other people? Maybe some of you have this story that they've been to other churches for years and years and years and you're just like well i mean just like just nothing was taught there yep. like it's just like i just got sick of sitting there like just nothing's being taught why well if they don't even have the word of god if i if i didn't have the word of god in front of me you know what i'd be teaching you i'd be like i don't know i'd be up here giving you motivational speeches or something I, I could go and I could read some, some, some Tony Robbins books or something, and I could be throwing some stuff at you. Some might work, some might not work. But, I mean, what are you seeing in churches today? Just motivational speeches. Where's the doctrine? The reason there's no doctrine, one of the reasons that there's no doctrine, is because there's no Bible. There's no Word of God. There's no power there. Turn to Revelation chapter number 22. I mean, talk about a boundary. Talk about a line that you need to keep in your life, a line that a pastor needs to keep. Get a bunch of people that come in here, and it always happens where there's like, you know, it's a generational shift or something, and then like half the church is like, we should go to the new King James or, or whatever. It's so much easier to understand. It's like you, know, you got a bunch of unsaved people that can't understand the Bible, and they convince the, the pastor the pastor to just like change, you know, to just, just take the, the word of God, that boundary, and just get rid of it. It's, it's unbelievable, but that's what happens. And then you end up with a church where people sit in the church for years and nothing is taught. Nothing of value and of power is taught. Because there's no doctrine if there's no word of God. There's just what this guy thinks. That's all. And maybe he's a good speaker. Maybe he can convince people that he knows what he's talking about. But it's not the word of God. That line is gone. Go to Revelation chapter number 22. Look at verse number 18. Maybe they have a KJV. Maybe they have a King James Bible, and maybe they have, you know, the gospel correct. Look at verse number 18. Revelation, number, number, uh, Revelation 22, verse 18. The Bible says this, at the very end of the Bible, I mean, I just love how God ends the Bible. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are in this book. God's saying, don't add unto my word. Well, what if we delete some of it? And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So, of course, very famous verses where God's saying, don't add to my word and don't take away from my word. Now, normally we apply this to the fools who decided to change the Bible, right? That's what we, we decide, you know, we apply this mainly, we apply it to false Bible version, somebody that's going to like, hey, I'm going to come up with a, a, a neater way to word things. And what do they do? They add to God's word and they take away from God's word. And God's saying, if you do that, you're done. But here's another application of this. That's why you see, you know, the false versions have got all kinds of bad doctrine from a false, they, they teach false gospels. 
to just like doctrines of fornication and doctrines of divorcing being okay. I mean, it's just, it's, it's endless how much the Bible has been changed. But, and we're talking only about saved, you know, gospel is correct, they have a King James Bible. Do these two verses apply to that, to that church? A Bi you know, the, the church that has a King James Bible and a church where the gospel is correct. Those two things. Could these two verses apply to that? Let me ask you this. What about a church that doesn't say everything in the Bible? You say, we got rid of all, you got, we got rid of 99% of the churches by saying, you know, those that have false Bibles and false Gospels, they're over there. But what about the 1% that has the Gospel correct and still has a King James Bible, but they, don't, they purposely don't preach certain things in the Bible? Isn't that taking away from the Word of God? Yeah. Things that they just never talk about. Things that they just never bring up. Turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 22. Deuteronomy, there's a lot of those things today. Leviticus 18, 22, I'll just read it for you. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as womankind, Amen. as with womankind, it is abomination. Homosexuality. We're just not going to mention that. We're just not going to mention all the perversion that's going on today. We just won't talk about it. That's a solution for a lot of churches. A lot of churches with a King James Bible, which means they're literally taking parts of the Bible and just ignoring parts of the Bible. Look, I'm not saying it's a direct application to, I'm not saying if a, if a pastor doesn't preach on certain things that he's a reprobate or something. I, I'm just saying, like, let's just use the, the methodology and apply it to people that just won't preach certain things. And look, are these things applicable today? You just look at what's happening around us, it's ridiculous. And to not preach things like that, look at Deuteronomy chapter 22, look at verse number five. How about just like, how about just like men and women and their roles? Like you just, and their biblical roles. Like this like makes people crazy today. And it's just, there's plenty of churches out there that have a King James Bible that just won't mention these things. Look at Deuteronomy 22, verse number five. I mean, Dress standards. You know, you know what dress standards, you know, what, you know what's being proven over the last few years is how important dress standards are. How important it is that God, I mean, everyone's like, well, does it really matter? I mean, does it really, I mean, do women really have to wear dresses and, and you know, I mean, can't, you know, I mean, is it, is it really a big deal? Does God really care how men and women look? I mean, looks, I mean, Looks are so, you know, no, God cares how people look. Literally. Why? Because it's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. Look at verse number five. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment both ways. For all that do so are abomination. They're saying the people are abomination. This, I mean... This, God is saying, now doesn't it make sense as you look at what's happening today, why God wants a distinction between even how men and women look? It's almost like he's some kind of genius. It's almost like he saw some of these things coming. But you say this stuff today and people will get angry. You will trigger people. So what do, what do pastors do? They just don't mention it. Oh, what's the big deal? What's the big deal, you know, pastor? What's the big deal? The big deal is that God wants men, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. God wants men to be masculine, and he wants women to be feminine. That's the big deal. He wants there to be a difference. And I'm going to explain to you why there is a difference, and why there needs to be a difference, and how that applies to the lines and the boundaries, and the fact that we need to set up those boundaries for the next generation. Look at verse 13. It says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men. What does that mean? Then he, he explains what it means. Be strong. Men should be strong. Men should be strong. Look at verse number, uh, go to Ephesians, or actually go to, um, go to Isaiah chapter uh, number 3. Go to Isaiah chapter number 3. I'm going to read for you Jeremiah 
chapter number 51. You're going to go to Isaiah chapter number 3, and I'm going to read for you Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse number 30. The Bible says this, talking about just how God, you know, people don't mention these things today. But I think that that's why we're in the situation that we are in today is because we're just deleting certain parts of the Bible, and we're not mentioning that as pastors today. Look at Jeremiah 51, verse 30. The Bible says, the mighty men, you're going to Isaiah chapter 3. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They have remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. They became as women. What does that mean? They did not fight, and their, their might failed. They became weak. They have burned her dwelling places, her bars are broken. Look at Isaiah chapter 3, look at verse number 12. Isaiah chapter 3, talking about the judgment on Judah now. Isaiah chapter 3, look at verse number 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, which they lead these, which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy past. Now look at the verse 13. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. You know what that's saying? When children are your oppressors and women rule over you in your nation, that's a judgment on you. That's not a good thing. It's saying the men should be strong and have might and lead. And when children, I mean, our children are our oppressors today. You ever gone to a restaurant, like in the last, I don't know, 10 years? Children are the oppressors of their parents. Yep. These parents today have no idea what to do with these kids. These kids are just oppressing their parents. When children are your oppressors and women rule over you, that's a judgment on the nation. That's why, that's why, and I was talking to Pastor Jimenez about this, but here, here's, look, I, I don't talk a lot, pol a lot about politics from the, uh, from the pulpit, but I will say this about the upcoming election. I'm going to say two things about the upcoming election. The upcoming election and the results of that election will show us two things. The first thing that I believe that they will show us is where God's patience is with this nation. Why? Because if it goes one way, I mean, that's a severe judgment. Severe. Severe judgment. Isaiah 3.12, right there. And another thing, doesn't really have to do with the sermon, but since I'm talking about this, another thing that I believe that is going to be epic about this election and the results of it, look, I'm just watching to see. I'm just watching to see, and I'm going to be a, a, a Christian soul winning the next week no matter what happens. I'll tell you that. But here's another thing. If it goes one way, and we're, I'm just talking about if it goes one way, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war will end the next week, or end very quickly. I do believe that. If it goes the other way, it will not. And I believe that has, that has serious end times implications right there. Or it could have serious end times implications. Because globalism is, is losing right now. Globalism and the people pushing it are, are getting beat down right now. And the results of this election will matter when it comes to that fight, right? But back to the point of the sermon, when, when women are ruling over you, that's a judgment. That's a judgment of God. But what does no one, no one, you can't say that, you, you misogynist or whatever. Turn to Jeremiah, or turn to Ephesians chapter 22. I'll make it worse. Let's just keep reading the Bible on this subject. The reason, what's the reason? What's the reason it's important that these lines are kept? That this is preached? What's the reason that God wants women to look like women, women to act like women, they're to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. <gasps> Internet explodes. I mean, you could not say anything more offensive than that today to certain people. You sexist, you hate women, all this stuff. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 22. It says, wives, submit yourself unto your husbands as unto the Lord. The reason that these lines are important with men and with women, just aside from the nation being judged, the reason that it's important is because men and women's roles in the family are different. And God calls out those, difference, those differences. It says, wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, 
even as Christ is, in the, is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. The wife is to submit to her husband as she would submit to the Lord. So that, that means a couple things. First of all, she's to submit to him in everything that's not against the Lord. But she's to submit to him in every... I mean, look, bossy, independent women don't want to hear that today. And there's a lot of those. Tell them so, you know, to submit to their husband triggered like crazy they'll go crazy and look here's another thing that's literally driving me nuts and i'll just rabbit trail this one for a second but it's wives not girlfriends not fiancés we've been engaged to for a hundred years it's wives and if one more idiot on the internet pops up pops up with a podcast applying this type of thing misquoting it applying this concept to like someone that he goes on a date with, I'm, you know, I'm gonna lose my mind. There's like Andrew Tate Jr. popping up like every five seconds now. I mean, these are just fornicating whoremongers is all they are. Yep. And this does not apply to you. This applies to the wives. Wives. Husbands, wives, they're married. But it's saying, you know, you know all it's saying? God needs these lines, men to look and act different, women to look and act different. Crazy. Why? Because they have different roles in the family. Because they have different roles. Look, folks, can we just use some logic for a second? In the family, someone's in charge. Everyone's like, it's a democracy. <laughs> we co-parent. Can we just follow this through for a second? What's a democracy? How good is a democracy if it's like one vote and one vote? Like, it's one-to-one -one again. I guess we have to do nothing. Someone is in charge, folks. Here's a test for you guys. For you married men, here's a test for you. If you've never said no and vetoed decisions, the person that's in charge, here's what that means. It's not you. That's what that means. Because someone will always cast the deciding vote. Look, we dwell with them according to knowledge. I, t I ask my wife for counsel. She is very smart. I take her counsel. I listen to my wife. I, I try to involve her in the things that we're doing, and, and we're, we're a partnership in this marriage. But let me tell you something. I'm in charge. There's times when nobody in my family understands why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. But it's just this needs to be done this way. And there is casting. You know, there, there is someone... In every household that is listening to this, I don't care if you're Christian or non-Christian, someone is in charge. And if you've never said, no, we're doing it this way, we're going this way, even if you say in a nice way and you should say in a nice way, well, we're just going to have to, I, I hear what you're saying, we're just going to have to move in this direction, um, you know, and that's just the, the final decision. If you've never done that, it's not you. You are, you are ruled by your wife if that's the case. And the Bible is saying that you should not be. The Bible is saying that I have chosen the husband to be in charge of the household. And it, look, it makes sense. He's supposed to be mighty. He's supposed to be strong. He's supposed to be spiritual. He's supposed to be submitted to Christ. He's supposed to be a good leader. Look, this is why he should be these things. So he can be that proper leader. But look, and the, the women are to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Titus 2 says. But that's just being destroyed today. And if you say those things today, you're called a misogynist, you hate women, you're a sexist. But guess what? That's very loving to women. Because let me tell you what, is, what hates women. What hates women is a philosophy that would take a beautiful young lady that has so much value and, 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 and things to bring into this Christian struggle, would take that beautiful young lady and tell her to go and, and, and just go and just fornicate with dozens of people. Just go, go give away your purity to a bunch of, you know, to a, some idiot who doesn't even care about you. Go tattoo yourself up. Put a bunch of stuff in your face, destroy your body. Now, those are the people that hate women. Yep. Amen. 
They hate them and they are successfully destroying them. Look, the opposite is true. It is the Bible that loves women. It is the Bible that is trying to keep these roles separate for the protection of, look, feminism destroys women. It was designed by a male, Satan. And it's doing an, an incredibly thorough job today. And, and guess what? The young lady, the young lady that believes in true biblical submission, let's, let's do some more logic here. The young lady that believes in true biblical submission to her future husband, not her boyfriend, her future husband, the woman that is going to keep herself pure and find a husband that has, keep, has kept himself pure and believes in, in submitting to her husband as unto the Lord. Guess what? You know what? You know what that's going to do? You know what that lady's going to do? That young lady's going to marry someone that she trusts. She's going to marry somebody. She's going, to, she's going to make a very, very good decision. As a matter of fact, the more she believes that, the more faith and absolute trust she has in the Word of God when it comes to submitting to her future husband, the better her decision will be. You know why? Because she's like, I don't want to marry some idiot. I don't want to marry some unspiritual fool that I'm going to be submitted to is going to be leading me throughout my life. See, the, the young lady that makes a bad decision is a young lady that buys into all this feminist garbage. And she's like, well, you know, if, if I'm just going to marry this guy, I can fix him. I, uh, he's got issues, I know. But I can fix him. And if he does a bunch of dumb things, I'll just step in. I'll just step in and I'll, like, veto his dumb things. Guess what, young lady? Guess what, lady? I've met this lady so many times that is married to a man. I've met this Christian lady before that is married to a man that goes out and makes all these stupid decisions. And she's submitted to him. She's like, oh, well, I'll come in and you won't fix all those stupid decisions, trust me. You're going to hitch your, you know, the young lady that believes the Bible, though, she will not hitch her wagon to that horse. Because she's like, ah, he's heading for a cliff. I can see it because I read the Bible. She will make a very, very good decision. But look, back to the lines. Back to the lines. Why erase these lines? Because erasing these lines, you know what it does? It erases the family. It erases God's perfect model for the family. Which is, the purpose of it is to preserve that line for the children. Everyone's like, oh, the man's in charge. Like, look, if, if you think that being in charge is, like, the best thing ever, you've never really been in charge. Being in charge means you take all the abuse. It means you take all the flack. It means literally in the Bible, in Ephesians chapter 5, that you may literally have to sacrifice your life for your wife. You may have to, like, physically give your life for your family. Being in charge, it's just someone has to be in charge. And God says that it's to be the husband because he's stronger. But it doesn't mean that the wife's role raising the children is not important. I mean, what in the world? We've totally downplayed the role of the mother in this society today. The role of the wife that supports her husband today. I don't know what I would do. I'd be completely lost if it wasn't for my wife. She is such a support structure to me, raising the children. I mean, you think that I would be able to raise children. I'm not, I don't, I'm not trying to lift my kids up here, but you think I'd be able to raise successful children in the Lord if it wasn't for my wife? Right. It would be impossible. It would be very difficult to do this job. It's a perfect model. Why don't we follow it? I mean, it's not trying to beat one person down and lift another person up. The mother's role in staying home and keeping the home and raising the children and teaching the children. I mean, especially in this day and age where we live. It is literally priceless, the Bible says. The Bible says that a virtuous woman like this, you literally can't put a price on it. Priceless. It's crazy that people would say that this is against women. Go out, women. Go out, young lady, and completely destroy yourself. 
Just ruin your life. And that is what is embraced over this. Over this perfect model. No. The reason that these lines are trying to be erased and the reason that we go back to this, that they're not... Look, so some pastor that will not stand up and preach these things because people are going to get upset at him, he, he hates his congregation. He hates his congregation. He hates the children in that congregation. And look, it's, it's all about keeping the lines for the children. It's about protecting the family. Because, you, look, you've got a strong family. Let me tell you something. All these, all these crazy perverts and all these people that are grooming children today and all these things, they're not coming after. They're not able to get to the kids that are being raised in this church. Because they're being raised by a, a strong father and a mother that's, that's uh, teaching them the Bible and, and a father that's, that's leading their home spiritually. It's like they can't get to them. They're getting to the ones. They're getting, you know who they're getting to? Sadly, the fatherless. They get to the ones that don't have that protection. And it, look, it angers me too, because I love the fatherless. And I love all children. I feel bad for all children in the public school system. I feel bad all, for all children that are being indoctrinated with all this liberal garbage and being confused with all this stuff. But they're not going to get to ours. Why? Because we're, fought, we're, we're keeping the lines. Say, why are these dress standards important? Why are these things? They're important because that's the lines that God said. It's like those are the lines that God built the building with. And who are you to say that this line should be over there? Right. Don't you start making decisions like that. Amen. You keep the lines where God put the lines. Because he's a, he's a better architect than you are. Turn to Revelation chapter number 2. Aside from churches, aside from churches, and I'm, I'm running out of time here, but look, you got to have lines in your life. you got to have boundaries in your life. Even just sins in general. Even just... You know, even just sins in general, churches won't preach about. Because they're like, oh, I know there's a bunch of people in this church that are into this sin. So even just sins, you know, you know the thing about hard preaching? The thing about hard preaching is, people love it until they don't. People love hard preaching until it smacks them in the face. People love hard preaching about problems that other people have. But once you start, you know, hitting on other people's, uh, hitting on people's individual sins, and then you hit one of those sins that that person is just kind of, they just kind of put their foot down. They're like, I'm keeping this one. And then you just preach on it. it, it like, it's like a kick in the chest to them every, every single time they hear it. That's why pastors don't preach stuff like that. Because they, they want to fill their, they want to fill the chairs. They don't want people to be offended. They don't want people to be upset. But look, what's the point of being just... Wrapping it all up, because I'm running out of town. Can you tell me what the point of having a King James Bible would be and being a fundamental Baptist church if the whole of the fundamentals weren't preached? Can you tell me what the point of that would be? Look at Revelation chapter 2. See, God, I'll end it here. God, people forget God's standard for a church. People forget God's standard for a church. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 1. This is Jesus here talking to, you know, telling John to write these letters to these churches. And, and it's an example. The reason that he's giving these, he's saying, these are, this is how I'm going to be for the churches. This is my standard for the churches. Look at verse number 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that hold the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The golden candlesticks are churches, by the way. They are the churches. The candlestick is the church. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. Sounds pretty good. These guys are working. They're laboring. They have patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. They're kicking out evil people, false prophets. And thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not. And has found them liars. These people, they got doctrine in this church. I love it. They're kicking out the people teaching the false things. They're doing what they're supposed to do. And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, hath labored and has not fainted. You know what? He's saying you got the doctrine and you got the heart. They got patience and they're working. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy, left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And look at this. You see how good this church was? They're out there doing works. They're doing good things. They're kicking out false prophets. They're holding to the doctrine, but they forgot the first works. 
I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. He's saying, you better get this right quick. Or what? Or you're not going to be a church. I'll take away the candlestick. So this is for all the people out there that are like independent Baptists, check. King James only, check. Soul winning. Uh, I think I can fix that in that church. I'll go there and I'll, I'll start my own soul winning program at that church. Guess what? Candlestick's already gone. It's not even a church. Fix what? Fix the building that's not a church that has no candlestick? Unless you just got there. You just got there like five minutes after they canceled the soul winning program, which never is the case. The people that just go to a church where like the pastor has no interest in soul winning, no interest in doing what? The first works. It's not a church. Why? Because they let that boundary go. And Jesus is saying you could be doing everything right. You could look, you could have the King James Bible, you could preach the whole Bible, you could be doing all these things, have all these lines right. And he's like, you're not out there as an ambassador for the gospel. You're done as a church. I mean, that's God's standards for a church. And that's what God means in 1 Peter chapter 4 when he says judgment begins at the house of God. That's why it was so serious in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Go back to Proverbs chapter 22, and let's just end it here. Proverbs chapter 22, look at verse number 28. <clears throat> look, folks, you've got to have your own personal standards, too. You've got to have your own personal boundaries, too. You better set those, dads, in your household. You better set those in your homes. And guess what? This world around you is designed to make you question your standards to make you move your boundaries, to convince you to tear them down in every way. But we need to have them. We need to hold on to them. Look at verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And the answer your children will see when they look at this, if you didn't set those boundaries, those standards, is they will say, my dad didn't set any landmarks. And then they will have to set their own. But most of the time they usually don't. So the point is, what chance would there be for those children if their fathers didn't set those landmarks and didn't hold those landmarks? So that's how important they are. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.